Well, good morning, uh, friends. Mark Milwee, uh, Trinity, Alabama, uh, Mount View Baptist Church. Uh, thank you for joining me today for a message I've entitled, How to Respond uh, to the Movement of God. I believe it's a very timely uh, message, uh, especially considering all the things that are happening uh, in our country uh, today in various uh, spots. It seems like that the Spirit is moving, and so this is a good time uh, to talk about uh, this subject. We're in Acts chapter 2 today, so if you have your Bibles, uh, let me uh, encourage you to grab your Bible and join me there. There, Acts uh, chapter 2. And as we move into uh, chapter 2, let me say this, that God takes the initiative when it comes to spiritual matters uh, in, in our life, and then it's up to us uh, to join him uh, in, in this work. I, I mean, think with me just a moment about the uh, disciples' experience at Pentecost. It was God who initiated the revival on the day of Pentecost. God took the initiative. God empowered the people. God poured out his spirit, and thousands of people came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, therefore, the question I think we need to ask ourselves uh, today as we begin is, what can I do to join God in the work that he is doing in the world today? What can I do? What does God want me to do? What should be my response? Well, I believe we see three actions that we should take from the Pentecost experience. Uh, number one, we should expect the Spirit to move. Uh, number two, we should allow God to work in and through our lives and then number three, uh, take every opportunity to lead people uh, to Christ. So uh, let's jump in and, and see what we can uh, pick up today. Uh, first response is this, we should expect the Spirit to move. Uh, look at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. There was a sense of expectancy in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, uh, just as there had been for the past 10 days since Jesus had ascended uh, into heaven. Uh, Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and, and to wait for the promise of God. In fact, he told them in verse 4 of chapter 1, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait from the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So can you expect, can you uh, imagine the electricity that was in the air as they came together each day expecting God's promise uh, to be fulfilled, expecting the Spirit uh, uh, to move? It, it had to have been an exciting time uh, to be a part of the church. I can just imagine there was this, this real sense of, you know, God is about to do something fantastic and I want to be a part of it. I, I don't want to miss it. Uh, Jesus said he's going to, he's going to, uh, you know, send us the baptism baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't even know what that means, but I can't wait for it uh, to happen. Well, um, <clears throat> God's timing is always perfect. Pentecost, or, or, or the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, as our Jewish friends would call it, dates all the way back to the Exodus. Uh, the feast is described in detail in Leviticus chapter 23, beginning verse 9. Uh, Pentecost was uh, celebrated uh, seven complete weeks, or 50 days after Passover. It began on the first day of the week following the Sabbath, meaning that its beginning would later coincide with Easter. Uh, Pentecost literally means 50th, and Shavuot means weeks, which is where those names come from. Uh, the celebration also coincided with the harvest season. Uh, the Feast of Weeks began by waving the first fruits of the barley harvest uh, before the Lord, and then it ended with waving the first fruits of the wheat harvest. On the actual day of Pentecost, there was this huge celebration. Every able-bodied man was expected to be there at, at the temple. Uh, the, the loaves were waved before the Lord. Two lambs were uh, sacrificed. There was a, then a big feast for everyone, for the poor, the stranger, the Levites, I mean everybody. So now you're beginning to see why I said God's timing is always perfect. Pentecost was a very popular festival. There were devout Jews from all over the world gathered in Jerusalem to participate. Add to this the fact that the Jewish people believe that this day also corresponds with the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, thus the birth of Judaism. It is no accident that God chose this day to empower the believers in Jerusalem with the power from on high, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. God could not have picked a better day to establish his church. 
And, and what a day it must have been when the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the promised one, uh, fell upon them, came to dwell in the hearts of, of men and women. Yes, there was this tremendous uh, spirit of expectancy, but my guess is that this experience exceeded all of their wildest dreams and, and expectations. So the first response we can make to the movement of God is we, we need to expect something to happen. Uh, we, when we go to church, we should go with a sense of expectancy. We, we shouldn't get up and say, oh, I got to go to church again. No, we we, we got to get up and say, I, I, I'm excited to go to church because the Lord's going to do something today. Uh, let me tell you quickly a story about that. Uh, when I was young, uh, junior high age, uh, I was a little rebellious. I didn't want to go to church one night. My dad was a preacher. I had to go all the time. Uh, it was never optional to go, you know. And, and, and so one night, it was a revival night. It was a Tuesday night. I specifically remember it. And I, I didn't want to go. And I remember telling my mother, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go tonight. And she said, well, you're going. And, and I'm like, no, no, please, I don't want to go. She said, go in there and get your clothes on. We're going to church. So we went to church, and um, all this time, um, for several years, we've been praying for my friend Morris to receive Christ. And that night, when the invitation was given, uh, Morris accepted Jesus Christ as his uh, Lord and Savior. And if I'd have stayed home, I would have missed it. I, I didn't go expecting anything to happen. Uh, but I got there and something uh, wonderful happened. In fact, uh, Morris is a preacher today and has been for, for, for many years. Uh, so we need, to, we, have a, a spent, uh, we need to have this sense of expectancy when we gather together that God's going to do something and I don't want to miss it. Well, that brings us to uh, the second response. Uh, uh, allow the Spirit of God to work in and through your life. Look at verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, notice that the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit is described in three distinct ways. First, it was auditory. Uh, they heard the sound like a, a mighty rushing wind. Uh, uh, one uh, scholar uh, compared it to the roar of a tornado as it barrels through. Uh, it was also visual. Uh, Luke describes uh, the Spirit as divided tongues of fire, which appeared and rested on each one of them. Uh, and so it, it was visual, but then number three, it, it was physical. It was demonstrated by the ability to speak in other tongues. So let's take a moment and examine these three aspects of the arrival of the promised uh, Holy Spirit. First, uh, the blowing of a mighty wind uh, has, a, has a double connotation. Uh, the Greek word pneuma has two meanings, wind and spirit. Often in the Old Testament, God is described in this way. For instance, 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, verse 11, uh, God is speaking to Elijah and he says, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. So the wind represented uh, the Spirit of God present in Jerusalem on this day. Uh, a double meaning is also found in verse 3 in, in reference to the word tongue. Uh, the, the word glossa, just like our word tongue, could either mean uh, the physical organ of the tongue or a word spoken by the tongue, uh, uh, a language. For instance, uh, I, I might say something like, I burned my tongue as I drank my coffee this morning, but we also say he likes to pray in his mother tongue. Yeah, you, you see the difference. Luke was trying metaphorically to describe what was happening on this day, and, and he was dealing with the power of God, and these were the closest analogies that he could come up with to describe the events as they were taking place. He writes, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them. Well, fire also represents God in the Old Testament. Uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel called down the fire from heaven to burn up the sacrifice to defeat the prophets of Baal. And of course, who can forget uh, the burning bush experience that Moses had in Exodus 3. Uh, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire uh, from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So fire represents uh, the purity and the holiness of God. Uh, speaking in tongues, then, was a demonstration uh, of the filling of the Holy Spirit. So, as you can imagine, uh, there's a lot of debate about, uh, you know, what type of tongues that Luke was talking about uh, on this day. Well, um, I want to take just a few minutes to talk about this because it is a, a controversial subject. 
Of course, our Pentecostal friends would say, uh, well, um, of course he's talking about glossolalia or, or speaking in an unknown tongue. I mean, what other kind of tongues are there? Uh, others have added that, no, it was not that. It was this gift of hearing that God gave on that day that enabled people to understand uh, in their own language. However, the evidence of Scripture indicates that it was the gift of tongues to speak in another intelligible language that was given on the day of Pentecost. I mean, it's the, it's the easiest and safest way to deal with this issue is to treat uh, the gift of tongues as, as known languages. Uh, the interpreter simply becomes a person uh, who can uh, interpret or make known to the congregation the message that's being spoken by the speaker in, in another uh, language. Uh, since tongues on the day of Pentecost were definite languages, we could easily make, you know, all instances uh, definite languages. I mean, this is a safe and rational position. It's a position held by many Christians. Uh, indeed, the word tongue may be ambiguous in verse 4, but the word dialectos or language is clearly used in verses 6 and 8. Uh, dialectos is transliterated into English as dialect or language. Uh, verses 9 to 11 also list the large number of different languages that were spoken that day. Uh, therefore, uh, many who deny or oppose uh, uh, the ecstatic view of tongues make great use of this tongues experience on the day of Pentecost. They refer specifically to the word dialectos and, and, and make their case that tongues, and, and in their mind all tongues, are, are specific uh, languages. But unfortunately for them, uh, this is not the only tongues experience uh, noted in the New Testament. Uh, for instance, uh, on the two other occasions in the book of Acts uh, where uh, tongues are mentioned, it's not dialectos, it's the word glossa. Uh, therefore, it's unclear exactly what the experience was since glossa can indicate either a specific language, uh, he is speaking in an, another tongue, or an ecstatic utterance. Uh, so, as I shared earlier, a glossa was used in verse 4 to describe what was happening on the day of Pentecost. However, while glossa is used in verse 4, dialectos is used in verses 6 and 8. Let me read them. Uh, verse 6, uh, and at the sound, the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own dialectos, his own tongue. And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Verse 8, uh, dialectos there again. Uh, so a case can be made that in Cornelius' home, Acts 10, something similar took place. Uh, verse uh, 47 of chapter 10, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So the implication can be drawn from these words that the experience uh, in Cornelius' home was similar to the Pentecost experience. Uh, and that might mean that the tongues spoken at Cornelius' home were, were languages, not ecstatic utterances. But once again, the message is unclear because the specific word used in Acts 10 is glossa and not dialectos. So who's right? Those who say that tongues are definite languages or those who say that tongues are an ecstatic utterance of an unknown heavenly language? Well, you might not like my answer, but I'm going to say they are both right. Tongues is not an either-or issue. It's a both-and issue, and let me explain why I say that. In the New Testament, tongues are both a specific language, dialectos, and an ecstatic utterance, uh, glossa, or glossolalia. While this statement is not necessarily comfortable for some people, I do believe it's biblical. We might not understand the experience. We might not have experienced the experience. It might not be within our personal range of experiences, but it is a viable, valid spiritual gift that is listed among the, the spiritual gifts. So to, to, to deny it is to invalidate or disparage a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. However, the overwhelming evidence of Scripture is that on the day of Pentecost, the experience that day was to speak in languages that were not their own. And is that not miracle enough? Uh, the gift of tongues demonstrated the power of God and in their lives. God enabled them to accomplish only what God could accomplish. God uh, allowed them uh, to, uh, his spirit to work in and through them and multitudes were saved. Multitudes were saved, listen, because evangelism is the natural result of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
I mean, just look at what's happening in, in Kentucky and other places in, in our world right now. A, a, a chapel service, you know, erupted into a revival. Uh, my news feed on, fe on Facebook just been blowing up with, with uh, these reports of revivals breaking out all over the place. Listen, God is on the move. Something supernatural is taking place and we want to be a part of it. So we should expect God to move. We should allow God to work in and through our life. And then number three, the natural outgrowth of all this is lead people to Christ. Uh, look at verse five. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem, uh, devout Jews, uh, uh, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, asking, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Well, we've already talked about God's timing. Uh, according to verse 5, uh, there were devout men present from, from everywhere, every nation under heaven, basically. Uh, we've already talked about God taking the initiative. Uh, each one heard them speaking in their own language. So the obvious question is why, or to echo the question from verse 12, what does this mean? Well, I believe it means at least two things. First, it means that God is always the one who initiates revival. We can plan for revival, we can pray for it, we can do with everything within our power to prepare our hearts for it, but ultimately God is the one who sends uh, revival. Uh, God can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime. This doesn't mean that we should sit idly by and, and just wait for the movement of God. I mean, we talked last time about all the believers and all that they were doing uh, during the, uh, this time between the ascension and, and, and the day of Pentecost. Uh, they were living with the sense of expectancy. They were faithfully waiting on the promise of God. Uh, they were meeting together uh, daily in anticipation. They, they worshiped, they prayed, they studied scripture. They didn't know exactly what this was going to be like, but they knew that Jesus promised that it was going to come. So they enthusiastically, enthusiastically longed for the movement of God, and we should do the same. Well, what else does this passage mean? It means that God is interested in the salvation of the entire world. Uh, look at verse 9, Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, uh, belong to Cyrene, uh, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Again, people were gathered in Jerusalem all over the world from every nation under heaven. And God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, enabled these faithful Christians to communicate the gospel in languages that could be understood. He did this because when Jesus says in John three sixteen that God so loved the world, that's exactly what he means. The love of Christ, listen, is for every person in every city, in every nation, in the entire world. Later in this chapter, we're going to discover that 3,000 souls were added to the church that day. But, but praise God, they, they didn't all stay there. They, they scattered out to the four corners of the earth with the message of Jesus Christ burning in their hearts and flowing from their lips. This is why I believe later when Paul went to start all those churches, he would oftentimes find believers already present in those cities. I believe you could trace many of those people back to that fateful day in Jerusalem. Well, now as I look around our country, I see that the world has come to us. We have tremendous opportunities to share Christ with people from every nation under heaven. Let's pray that God will use us to reach out in his name to those all around us. Because again, verse 12, and all were amazed and perplexed saying uh, to one, what does this mean? It means that God initiates revival, that God provides the vehicle for revival. On the day of Pentecost, it was the gift of tongues. It also means that God is interested in the salvation of every person on earth. Our responsibility then is to live in expectation. Our responsibility is to allow God's spirit to move through in and through our lives. Our responsibility is to take every opportunity to lead people uh, to Christ. In fact, let me close with this uh, today. Pentecost season began with the waving of the barley loaf, uh, and it ended with the waving of the wheat loaf.
Some have suggested that the barley is symbolic of the Jewish people who were the first to receive the message of Christ and that the wheat symbolizes the Gentiles who later received the message. The celebration included the sacrifice of a sacrificial lamb on the altar. Well, Jesus Christ is our sacrificial lamb who was slain to take away the sins of the world. It's our responsibility to take this message to the nations. Therefore, let's live in expectation. Let's allow God to work through us in anticipation as we long for the movement of God to bring salvation to every person in our world. I'm so excited to see God's Spirit moving in, in many places uh, in our world, and I want to be a part of it. And my prayer today is that God would use you, He would use me, to bring as many people as possible into His kingdom. Well, thank you for watching today. God bless you.